All right, I want to invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Acts, chapter 16. Acts 16. Acts is the fifth book of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and then Acts. This morning is the first sermon in our new seven-part series in Acts entitled The Gospel Mission in Europe. As today we will see the Apostle Paul and now Silas, no longer Barnabas, set out on what is the second of three missionary journeys that the Apostle Paul will embark on through the end of the book of Acts. That first missionary journey covered chapters 13 and 14, as Paul and Barnabas set out from their home-based church up in Antioch in Syria. As the Holy Spirit set these men apart and called that church to be a sending church that would send out missionaries from their congregation that would go to unreached people groups with the gospel. And so Paul and Barnabas traveled to many different cities in that surrounding region of Asia, preaching the gospel first to the Jews and then to the Gentiles, and then planting churches made up of those whom the Holy Spirit was bringing to life and causing to trust in the accomplished work of Jesus Christ for them. And so churches got planted in Cyprus, in Antioch and Pisidia, in Iconium, in Lystra, and in Derbe. And though Paul experienced much persecution and physical suffering along this journey, even being stoned to the point of being on the cusp of death, for Paul, the pain was well worth the gain of seeing this new spiritual life be born in these disciples of Jesus and seeing these churches get planted that would serve as outposts for the gospel moving forward. Paul also appointed elders in each one of these churches that got planted so that spiritual leadership and shepherding would continue to be provided as that church sought to live on mission and spread the gospel further into their cities. Well, after Paul and Barnabas returned home to Antioch, after this first missionary journey, they had to pause their missionary efforts and deal with a critical crisis of faith and doctrine with the church as some Jews from Jerusalem had come up to their church and were proclaiming that true salvation could only come to the Gentiles if they also got circumcised in addition to putting their faith in Jesus Christ. That faith alone in Christ alone was not sufficient for the forgiveness of their sin, but that they also had to do something in this case, be circumcised in order to truly be saved. And false religions since that day have been putting forward the message that we in some way have to contribute to our salvation by what we do or do not do. And yet Paul and the other apostles fought hard in chapter 15 to maintain the purity and the truth of the gospel, namely that we have, are, and will always be saved by God's grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, to the glory of God alone. For as soon as those Gentiles were hearing and believing the gospel in all the cities that Paul was preaching in, they were immediately filled with the gift and the person of the Holy Spirit. God himself, nothing else was required for that gift and their salvation, but only the acknowledgement that they brought nothing to the table, but wholly depended upon the accomplished work of Jesus Christ for them. And so once that, got, once that debate got settled, Paul returned back to his church and reported the decision of the Jerusalem council. And the disciples rejoiced at the encouragement that it brought them. Well, now today we'll see Paul set out on this second missionary journey in order to spread the gospel to more people and in more places. And so now as we listen to the voice of God from the word of God, for what scripture says, God says, wherever you're at this morning, if you're able, I want to invite you to rise with me. As we stand in attention to the voice of our God from his word, we're going to start in chapter 15, verse 36, and then we'll read through 16, verse 15. Sometime later, Paul said to Barnabas, let us go back and visit the brothers in all the towns where we preach the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. Barnabas wanted to take John, also called Mark, with them, but Paul did not think it wise to take him because he had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not continued with them in the work. They had such a sharp disagreement that they parted company. Barnabas took Mark and sailed for Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and left, commended by the brothers to the grace of the Lord. He went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. He came to Derbe and then to Lystra, where a disciple named Timothy lived, whose mother was a Jewess and a believer, but whose father was a Greek. The brothers at Lystra and Iconium spoke well of him. 
Paul wanted to take him along on the journey, so he circumcised him because of the Jews who lived in that area, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. As they traveled from town to town, they delivered the decisions reached by the apostles and elders in Jerusalem for the people to obey. So the churches were strengthened in the faith and grew continually in number. Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. When they came to the border of Mysia, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. So they passed by Mysia and went down to Troas. During the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. From Troas, we set out to sea and sailed straight from Somathrase, and the next day on to Neapolis. From there, we traveled to Philippi, a Roman colony in the leading city of that district of Macedonia. And we stayed there several days. On the Sabbath, we went outside the city gate to the river, where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and began to speak to the women who had gathered there. One of those listening was a woman named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth from the city of Thyatira, who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. When she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us to her home. If you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us. This is God's holy and necessary word for you today. Let's pray together. Father, we do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from your mouth, O God. Just as our bodies need food and water and air to survive, so do our souls need to feed upon your very word to us. So nourish us today by your word that we may truly live. And we pray this in Christ's name and for his sake. And together we say, amen. Please be seated. Paul's second missionary journey that technically started at the end of chapter 15 and that will run through the end of chapter 18 was a very significant missionary effort. As Paul visited many significant cities and planted churches in those cities, to which Paul would then later write and send letters back to those churches, many of which now comprise and make up our New Testament scriptures today. Cities like Philippi and the letters to the Philippians. Cities like Thessalonica and the first and second letters to the Thessalonians. Cities like Corinth and the first and second letters to the Corinthians and cities like Ephesus and the letter to the Ephesians. All of those churches got planted and established as Paul and Silas traveled along the second missionary journey, as they preached the gospel in the places that the Holy Spirit led them to, and as the Holy Spirit was working in the hearts of these Jews and Gentiles, bringing them to the point of trusting in Jesus' death and resurrection for the forgiveness of their sin and the counting of Jesus' righteousness as their very own. But though Paul had a great desire and passion to preach the gospel to those who were still dead in their sin, which we're going to see in point one, the very first thing that Paul did along this second missionary journey was revisit the churches he had already planted in order to strengthen them in their faith. He wasn't only concerned with making new converts, which in many ways is the great failure of the church growth movement over the past couple of decades. For while the desire to see new disciples of Jesus made is a good and right desire, when people say things like the church only exists for those who are not here yet, it reveals that the pendulum has swung way too far in the other direction, and we have missed that we have been commanded to make and mature disciples of Jesus for the glory of God. Not only do we deeply desire to see new disciples of Jesus made through repentance of sin and faith in the gospel, but the great commission of Matthew 28 includes Jesus' command to teach one another to obey all that Christ has commanded us. 
And so Paul first visits these new churches that he had planted on his first missionary journey in order to strengthen them in their faith. And how did he do that? Well, he sought to strengthen them in their faith by reporting the decisions that were made at that Jerusalem council. Here's what verse 4 says. As they went on their way through the cities, they delivered to them for observance the decisions that had been reached by the apostles and elders who were in Jerusalem. So the churches were strengthened in their faith and increased in number daily. And I cannot belabor this point enough. The truth that we are saved, that we are justified and declared not guilty in the sight of God, by faith alone, in Christ alone, the very doctrine that got clarified at that Jerusalem council is not only what is true of our salvation, it is also what we need to believe more fully in order to grow and be strengthened in our faith. Because the human temptation is always to look at ourselves our efforts, our successes, our failures, and then either be filled with pride when we succeed and obey or despair when we fall in sin. But both of those responses reveal that though we may be religious people, we have not yet truly embraced the glorious realities of the gospel. For the gospel tells us that we are no more loved by God when we obey than when we fall. When we lose our tempers with our kids and we say things that we should not say. When we give in to temptation and look at things online that we know that God hates. When we cheat God and others by not giving our very best at work or on the sports field or in the classroom. When we covet the blessings that God has given to others, material possessions, their spouse, their kids. Yes, we are called to repent of all of those sins against God, confess those things before our Lord, but we need not doubt God's love for us or that we are still adopted as his children because our status before God has and will never be dependent upon what we have or have not done but only upon what Jesus Christ has done for us through his perfect life of obedience, his death on the cross, and his resurrection from the grave. And so just as those churches were strengthened on missionary journey number two by believing the gospel more fully, we today are strengthened in our faith as we believe to a greater extent as well that our status before God is all about having Jesus' righteousness counted as our own, that our hope is built on nothing less and therefore on nothing else than Jesus' blood and righteousness, that we dare not trust the sweetest frame, but we wholly lean on Jesus' name. It was the doctrine of justification by faith alone in Christ alone that Paul leads out with on missionary journey number two. And so what we want to see in our text this morning is that it is out of, only out of a deep love for Jesus Christ that we will then move out to spread the gospel just as Paul did on this journey. We're going to develop that this morning by seeing first Paul's evangelistic zeal. Second, we'll see Paul and Luke's visit to Philippi. And third, we'll see the significance of household baptisms. And so first, let's see Paul's evangelistic zeal. In chapter 16, we see Paul display through his actions a deep passion and zeal for others to come to saving faith in Jesus Christ. Now, many study Bibles have a bunch of maps at the back of them. If you have one, you could look at it. Or if not, go online later and just Google search it and see where Paul went on missionary journey number two. And you will see how impressive those travels were. For not only did Paul first revisit the cities that once tried to kill him and take his life, but Paul ended up mostly by foot, though with a little sailing by ship, as far north at the end of our text today is the city of Philippi, which is in modern day Greece, a 1200 mile journey from where he started in Antioch in Syria. That's about the same distance as Dearborn down to 
Orlando, Florida. Nobody makes that trek through mountainous terrain and dangerous seas reluctantly, begrudgingly, but only out of a deep passion and commitment to their cause. And in Paul's second letter to the church at Corinth, he reveals what it is that is driving him to do all that he does in each of these missionary journeys. Listen to 2 Corinthians 5.14. It says, for the love of Christ controls us. Because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. What did Paul just say there? He said that it was the love that Jesus had for him made clear and revealed through Jesus' death on the cross and resurrection from the grave that now compels Paul. It controls Paul just as it should for all those for whom Christ has died so that we no longer live for ourselves, but for him, for his glory, and to spread his kingdom to the ends of the earth. I've often said that nobody's going to be guilted into witnessing or evangelizing to others. Guilt is not going to work to ever get somebody to share their faith in Jesus with others. The only thing that would cause someone like Paul to travel 1,200 miles in one direction or to give us the boldness to open our mouth and to share our faith in Jesus with a coworker, a neighbor, or a family member is that the love of Jesus Christ has compelled us to do so. The person who has been changed by Jesus' love for them so that our love for Jesus now becomes the strongest love that we have in all of our life, that person will be the person who opens their mouth, who witnesses and who testifies because we talk about the things that we love the most. And this was true for Paul who then sets out on missionary journey number two in order to plant other churches and share the gospel in regions that he had not gone to on the first journey. And yet as he embarks on journey number two, we read some very interesting words in chapter 16, that Paul had been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. And when they had come up to Mysia, they attempted to go into Bithynia, but the spirit of Jesus did not allow them. Now the Holy Spirit, the person of the Holy Spirit, whom Luke is clearly showing in these verses to be the third person of the Trinity, God himself, by calling him the spirit of Jesus, as Jesus has already been proven to be God through his resurrection from the grave, The Holy Spirit is leading Paul into the places that he wants him to go through closed door after closed door. Now, Paul eventually receives a vision in verse 9 from a man from Macedonia calling him to come there. But up until that point, all Paul was receiving was, no, not here. No, not here. And he had to wait for the Lord to say, yes, go here. And friends, how often do we pray for God's direction and guidance in our life? And yet, though the Holy Spirit's guidance may come through closed doors as well, we get frustrated by that negative guidance. We think God is not hearing us. He doesn't listen to our prayers. He doesn't care. But these closed doors are often true guidance of preventing us from going into the places that God has not called us to go so that we might, in God's time, end up in the exact places he has called us to go and where we will receive his blessings. And so eventually, God's will for Paul was made clear. And he set sail from Troas until they ended up in the prominent city of Macedonia called Philippi, which was a Roman colony. And so second this morning, let's see Paul and Luke's visit to Philippi. Now, students of the book of Acts over the last 2,000 years have noticed that all of a sudden in chapter 16, as well as in chapters 20 and 27, this little word we starts to appear over and over again. The first occurrence was in verse 10. And when Paul had seen the vision, immediately we 
sought to go into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. Over and over again in our text today, we heard that little word we used to describe Paul and now Luke's journey up to Philippi. Remember that Luke is the author of the book of Acts. And while Luke was good friends with Paul, received many of the details from Paul that he includes in the book of Acts, sometimes Luke was simply an eyewitness to those very details. As Luke now joins Paul and Silas and Timothy and Troas and sails with them all the way up to Philippi. Now, Philippi was a very prominent coastal city in what is now modern-day Greece. And while Paul, Silas, uh, Timothy, and Luke were not exactly sure what to expect when they got there, they knew for certain through that vision that God had called them to go and preach the gospel. And so on the Sabbath day, since there was no Jewish synagogue in this predominantly Gentile region, Paul heads outside of the city to search for any Jews and God-fearing Gentiles who had come together to pray. Because Jewish tradition held that if there were not 10 Jewish men in a city to establish a synagogue, a place of prayer could be established in its place. And so Paul is searching for this place of prayer and comes upon these, these women who had come together and were praying, one of whom was named Lydia. Now, the text gives us some pretty interesting clues that Lydia was a very prominent, wealthy business owner, as she was a seller of purple goods, which was a rare and extravagant enterprise in that day. For these clothes that had purple hues within them, the dye from which came from shellfish and was hard and hard to get and rare to find. These purple clothes were often sold and associated with royalty, and people of great wealth. And so Lydia, as a seller of purple goods, would have done extremely well for herself. Furthermore, she owned a home that was large enough to then invite Paul and his whole ministry team back to you in order to stay the night. And it was very likely the place that this new church plant in Philippi first began to meet. Lydia is the very first European convert to the Christian faith that Luke tells us about in the book of Acts. And what we see happening here with Lydia is what we see consistently happening throughout the book of Acts and the rest of the New Testament, namely that when conversion of a heart takes place, it is not because we have opened our hearts to God, but because God has intervened and changed the disposition of our hearts. Here's what verse 14 says, the Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. And again, this also cannot be stated enough, that salvation is the work of God from beginning to end. As it takes a work of God to change our hearts from desiring the things of this world to now desiring the things of God and his kingdom. So God intervened in the life of Lydia, changing, opening her heart so that she heard and believed the gospel. And friends, you can be certain that if the eyes of your hearts have been opened to behold the glorious realities of Jesus Christ, so that you have turned away from trusting in the things of this world to now trusting in Jesus, it is because God himself has done that very work in your life as well. Well, finally this morning, let's see the significance of household baptism. Verse 15 says this, and after she, that's Lydia, was baptized and her household as well, she urged us saying, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. Now, after the Lord opened Lydia's heart so that she believed the gospel, she then received from Paul and his ministry team the sign of the new covenant, which was baptism. But not only did Lydia receive the sign of baptism upon her body, so did her entire household, of whom we're told nothing else about. Now, when Matt stood up here this morning and made his profession of faith in Jesus Christ, Matt was not baptized. And that's because, as he said, 16 years ago, as a baby, he received the new covenant sign of baptism at that point, long before he had any faith of his own. 
Next Sunday, when Jonas Englert stands up here and makes his profession of faith, the same will be true of him. However, a few weeks back, when Glenn Smith stood up here and made his profession of faith, he was then immediately baptized because he had never received the new covenant sign of baptism prior to that point. So what is going on here? You see, when God gave Abraham the sign of the covenant in the Old Testament, he gave Abraham that sign of circumcision because Abraham had already believed the gospel promises of God. Abraham, as we saw two weeks ago, was justified before God, declared righteous in God's sight by faith alone in God's gospel promises. And then Abraham received the sign of a covenant sealing the righteousness that was now his. The sign didn't save him. It wasn't required for his salvation. He was already saved by believing in the gospel promises. And so whenever someone comes to saving faith in Jesus Christ later in life, as Glenn did, as Abraham did, and as all these adults in the book of Acts are, as first-generation Gentile believers, they are to receive the sign of baptism at that point, sealing the salvation that is theirs by faith. It was circumcision in the Old Testament, baptism in the New. But in Genesis 17, God told Abraham that not only was the covenant sign to be given to those who had faith, but also to their entire household, to their children, and even to the servants that were part of that household. They also were counted as these covenant members set apart for God, though they also had to come to saving faith at some point later in their life. And so when we see Lydia come to saving faith and have her household baptized, when we see the Philippian jailer come to saving faith and have his household baptized in next week's text, what we are seeing is those patterns from the Old Testament maintained and repeated still in the New Testament. Namely, that those who come to saving faith in Jesus Christ, when they repent of their sin and trust in Jesus for the forgiveness of that sin, they are then to be baptized, receiving the covenant sign that seals the salvation that is theirs through faith, and so is their entire household, their children. And so we as a church, as well as every Reformed and Presbyterian church, baptizes the infants of professing Christians because we understand this to be how God has instructed the covenant sign to always be applied since Genesis 17 onward. This was the pattern of the early church as well. And why you don't see Paul or any of the apostles address this issue in any of their letters which you would think you would see if a long-standing practice for God's people was already changed. But it wasn't. The same pattern has been happening since Genesis 17. It wasn't until the 16th century when out of the Reformation period, the Anabaptists, who saw the error of the Catholic Church as they were proclaiming that an infant that got baptized was saved, entered, entered into a state of grace, having their original sin washed away, that they rightly rejected that understanding, but then completely rejected the covenant sign being placed upon infants. But Martin Luther and John Calvin, the other reformers, they didn't come to that conclusion because they understood that the misuse of something does not negate its proper use. Let me say that again. The misuse of something ought not to negate its proper use. Just because some get drunk with alcohol does not mean that the proper use of alcohol cannot be partaken of. Just because some within church history have misused and abused the covenant sign does not mean we don't apply that covenant sign in its proper form. And so just like in the old covenant, children of professing Christians are to receive the new covenant sign of baptism. And then we work as parents and as a church and we pray that just like Matt did today and Jonas will do next Sunday, that child comes to saving faith in Jesus Christ and will one day profess that faith, completing their baptism. 
And so as we close this morning, it was Paul's deep love and passion for Jesus Christ and for the gospel that led him out into this new territory, led by the Holy Spirit to go up to Philippi, and he continued to preach the gospel there, and the Holy Spirit kept bringing new hearts to life because it is the word of God preached and applied that does the work of God in saving and changing lives. And so may our love for Jesus compel us to do likewise. And may 2 Corinthians 5.14 be true of us, that we no longer live for ourselves, but for him who for our sake died and rose again. Let's pray together. Father, we praise you and we acknowledge the work that you have done in our hearts and lives to make us alive and to bring us to yourself. May we see Jesus Christ in all of his glory, high and lifted up and be filled with such love for him that we can say like Paul, we no longer live for ourselves, but for him who died and rose again. May we live on mission for him in our lives this week, and may your kingdom come more fully to the earth. We pray this in Christ's name and for his sake. Amen. Amen. May our love for Christ and our gratitude of the grace we've been shown 